So we've defined uh, matroids and given some examples of them in the previous lecture. Uh, the most basic problem on a matroid is if you're given a weight function, try to find a uh, maximum weight, um, a maximum weight independent set. So let's let's write this uh, the fundamental problem down here. It's as follows: Given a matroid on a ground set E and uh, script I the, the the independent sets, and given a weight function. W, we can think of this as um, mapping from the edges to R. In other words, it just assigns a weight to every, to every edge. The problem is to find an independent set maximizing the sum of the weights, which we can write using similar terminology as we've been using throughout all of these lectures, but I'll just write, write what this is. Um, the sum over all E in I of the weight on element um, E. The most natural algorithm to, uh, so, so as an aside here, it's important to think about uh, this problem and think about what not only what kind of problems you can map into the setting but perhaps what kind of problems you cannot so for example we've been using the terminology of independent set an example uh, in graph here we call independent an independent set is also uh, often used to denote a set such that uh, a subset of the nodes such that no two nodes have an edge joining them and a notorious hard problem in graph theory is to find even just a maximum cardinality independent set. So uh, it would also be a good exercise if you're getting used to uh, the terminology and to the definition of matroid to think about why can we not map that problem into the one that I've written on this slide. Specifically, why is the step set the, the independent sets of, of, a, of a graph defined in the way I just said, nodes that are not joined by any edge? Why is that? Does that fail to give a matroid? Clearly, it fails the second property since it, it, it satisfies the first property. But it's again, it's worth checking. Okay, so uh, now let's uh, a very natural algorithm to give is is the greedy algorithm for solving this problem. And the fundamental result of matroids, which we're going to prove in this lecture, is that the greedy algorithm is optimal um, if and only if our set is a matroid. So, but before we get ahead of ourselves, the greedy algorithm does the following. We order the elements. In other words, we rename the elements if necessary so that the weights are uh, decreasing. And then we initialize to the empty set. And I just go through the elements in a single pass. And so at the ith iteration, I'm looking at the ith element. If I can add it, I add it. Otherwise, I pass and I move on. So in other words, at the ith iteration, if the subset that I have so far, that would be i, i minus 1. I guess I'm not using subscript. So if, if, this, if, if, if i, which is what I'm updating, uh, plus the ith element, I'm just using this notation. It's a little bit easier than writing unions. Uh, plus the ith element is an independent set, then I update by adding that element. Otherwise, I pass. And then at the end, I just return i. So let's run through this. So I start with the empty set. I look at the first element, which is the heaviest. Unless this is a loop, then we know 
that the first element is satisfies this. So, so this algorithm will always add the heaviest element unless it so happens to be, uh, to be a loop. In other words, um, if it's, for example, the zero function, the, the, the zero vector in a, in a linear matroid, then I can't add it even if the weight assigned to it is very big. So the question that we, of course, are asking is, isn't, could it be possible that we add, that we greedily decide to add a heavy element, an enticing element early on, that's going to cost us, that's going to block us from adding many elements downstream? And the answer here is no. So let's write this theorem. And it's interesting to note that, it's a, that, it, that it is, in fact, a characterization of matroids that greedy, uh, that greedy succeeds. In other words, that it indeed solves this problem optimally. The theorem says the following. The greedy algorithm returns a max weight base for all w actually if it's a base we, we would want it to be uh, we would want it to be non-negative if and only if m is a matroid so let's just be clear about what the if and only if condition is saying this is not saying that for any way w the only way that greedy succeeds is if we have a matroid because if w is the all ones vector or the actually even easier the all zeros vector nothing precludes it from being that then certainly we can solve the maximum independence set problem over even problems that are not matroids this is saying as we'll see in the proof that if our uh if our set m with with ground set e and in, in, an independent system i is not a matroid then there exists some non-negative weight function for which the greedy algorithm will fail. Um, the forward direction is clear. No matter what the weight function is, if indeed we have a matroid, then this algorithm that I just wrote down is, is guaranteed to uh, produce the maximum weight. So let's, let's jump into this proof and see how this uh, goes. So let's do the first, let's do one, the, the, the direction uh, first where we see that if M is a matroid, then greedy uh, is guaranteed to, su to succeed. So let's first assume that M is a matroid. And uh, let me write down what the algorithm produces. So I, I want to write down not only its final trace, I'm sorry, not only its final output, I, but everything it did at all intermediate stages. Um, until, it, until it's stabilized. Right? At some point, when i becomes a base, we know that this, this algorithm is still going to check all of the other elements, but it's not gonna add anything, anything new. So um, let's let the uh, trajectory of the algorithm be, well, it starts with the independent set I'm sorry, the empty set uh, initially by definition of the algorithm. That's how it's initialized. And then it, uh, uh, it, it, it continues in this way. And at the end, it has produced something that has the rank of M. So actually, let me let me be a little more clear on my notation here. Let's 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 consider the trace all the way until the end. But but at some point it will have stabilized. And now I want to make clear that at every iteration, uh, what, what do we know? So let's just note something about about these. The, what is the cardinality of i k? By definition of the algorithm, this is less than or equal to k. It's possible that it's strictly less if it couldn't add, but it's also possible that it is k. But it certainly couldn't be more than k because the greedy algorithm at most adds one element at every, at every stage. So here's how this proof proceeds. We're gonna show that at any iteration, um, so we show that at any iteration k, 
there exists an optimal solution to the problem, and that's going to be a base BK. So there exists an optimal solution um, i.e. a max weight base and I'll denote that by B sub K that satisfies the following so such that the elements that I've selected so far belong to that base and the elements that I that are not in uh, that are that are in BK but not in my solution so far I haven't skipped over any of them so in other words at IK let's let's put some numbers to it let's look at what happens the fifth iteration I5 has 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 elements. So let's suppose it took the first and third element. So it skipped over 2, 4, and 5. What this, what, what we need to show, what we will show, and we'll imply the result, is that there is an optimal solution which incorporates the two elements we chose, 1 and 3, and does not incorporate the three elements that we skipped, 3, 4, and 5. Because if every optimal solution has not only one and three, but also some of one of uh, two, four, or five, then it means our algorithm has already irrevocably made a mistake because we can never we can never go back. Okay, so this is what this is what this algorithm uh, this is what this result is 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 going to show, and uh, and we're going to show this by induction. Um, so we we prove by induction on k and the base case is k equals zero which is obvious because at that point we have not added anything so any optimal solution is a superset of us and we haven't skipped anything so it also satisfies the second property so at k equals zero i zero is the empty set so the two properties clearly uh, hold so let's assume that this holds, assume that this is true. What I mean, what I mean by this is these two, these two things here. Assume this is true up to iteration k minus one. So in other words, at time k minus one, I've my greedy algorithm has constructed i k minus one. The inductive hypothesis guarantees. Uh, that there exists an optimal solution that's a base that's I'm going to call BK minus one with the two properties above I'm just writing them out again IK is a subset of BK of BK minus one and uh, BK minus one minus IK minus one is a subset of K all the way to N I introduced N here so let me just write and is I think this is probably obvious, but just to be just to be complete. Okay, so now let's investigate what happens at iteration k. And our task is going to be to show that we can construct the new optimal solution that continues to satisfy this property. So what happens at iteration k? What does greedy do at iteration k? It can do one of two things. At iteration k, it's examining the kth element. It either is going to add this to i k or it's going to, to i k minus one, or it's going to pass. So um, if the algorithm passes, so if it does not take element k, why did it do that? By definition of the algorithm, the only reason it didn't do that is uh, because it must be that i k minus one plus that kth element ruined independence. There's no longer independence. I uh, independent. But if i k minus one was a subset of b k minus one, then certainly this means that 
uh, k cannot be an element of bk minus 1 because otherwise uh, bk minus 1 wouldn't be an independent set. So this implies that k is not an element of bk minus 1. And so all I need to do is just set bk, define bk as equal to bk minus 1, and now we have a set that's optimal again because bk minus 1 is optimal, so of course bk is the same thing, it's still optimal, and it satisfies all the properties that we needed. So bk satisfies the induction. Okay, so that means that what we have left to show is uh, we, need to, we need to understand what happens in the setting where we, we do take that element. So, um, so again, there's two things that, that greedy could do. So now, if uh, the algorithm does take k, so that means that ik is equal to ik minus 1 plus k, let's look at the two possibilities. Well, the two possibilities are either k is an element of bk minus 1, so if k is an element of bk minus 1, then again, uh, we're done. Let me clean up my writing a little bit. If k is an element of bk minus 1, it means that ik is a subset of bk minus 1. So again, we just set uh, bk equal to bk minus 1 and, 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 and we're in business. So the other uh, possibility is that suppose that k is not in bk minus 1. Now is the only interesting part of this proof because all of a sudden we see that we have to now develop a new, uh, we have to come up with some, with some new set. Now let's see if this is possible even. Um, so if, if k is, is not in bk minus 1, so be it, but let's see what happens. This means um, that you know, ik is an independent set by definition. So, uh, and uh, bk minus 1 is an independent set, of course, because it's taken to be a basis. So that means that by taking elements from bk minus 1, I can add them to ik until I form a base. So we can extend ik to a base by taking all the other elements of bk minus 1. In other words, all elements of bk minus 1 except for k because we already know that k is, is I shouldn't even write it like this, um, by Let's write it by taking by taking elements of bk minus one. So this produces a base. Let's call this b dash. And we know that k is in b dash and k is not in bk minus one. So b dash and, and bk minus one are, are different. And in particular, um, because I built b dash by taking elements from bk minus 1, I, I know that what's in b dash but not in bk minus 1? Well, it's just that element k that, that was not in bk minus 1. Otherwise, I, I just built up from, from bk minus 1. Uh, and since we proved in the previous lecture that all bases have the same number of elements, we also know that um, if bk if b dash has an element that's not in bk minus one, well, it, it must also be that uh, there is some element in uh, bk minus one that's not in uh, b dash. 
In fact, there's a, there's, there's a unique such element. Okay, which let's let's try to find this element j in our in our list in our ordering that we've ordered in decreasing magnitude. So by assumption, we know that b k minus one. Everything that's in b k minus one, but not in i k minus one, is a subset of um, k plus one to uh, n. Note that I omitted k. That's because we assumed that bk uh, minus. That's because we assume that bk minus one doesn't contain k. So that implies that j has to be one of those elements. So j is either the k plus first element or the k plus first second element, etc. On down to n. And in particular, by our ordering, this means that the weight assigned to j can't be more than the weight assigned to w k. And you can see that this is where the proof basically finishes because what this implies is that the sum of the weights of b dash are just the sum of the weights in bk minus 1 plus wk minus wj, which is greater than or equal to w of bk minus 1. This is not a contradiction. We're not, there's no strict inequality. It could very well be that the weights of wk, wk plus 1, wk plus 2 are all equal, all the way to wj. It simply means that bk minus 1 was assumed to be an optimal base, and we found a base, b dash, that has weight at least equal to bk minus 1. In other words, must be equal. And therefore, this means that b dash is an optimal base that satisfies the two properties we need. That satisfies the required properties, namely, IK is a subset of B dash, and B dash minus IK is a subset of all the subsequent elements. We have not made any irrevocable mistakes. So we can take, therefore, bk equal to b dash. We've constructed the base that we want. And uh, in particular, you can see that this completes this part of the proof. In other words, we've shown in, uh, in, in this slide and the previous slide that if we have a matroid for any non-negative weight function w, uh, the greedy algorithm finds a maximum weight base. All right, now let's turn to the converse and show that actually the success of the greedy algorithm for all weight W, for all weights, non-negative weights W, in fact, uh, provides a characterization of, of a matroid. So let's, so let's show, uh, let's show this by, by the converse. So, uh, sorry, by the contrapositive. So let's show, let's suppose that we have some ground set E and some collection of sets, which I'll also call I, I hope that's not confusing, that is not a matroid. This pair is not a matroid. What does that mean? Well, it means that I either fails to satisfy the downward closure property, um, or it uh, fails the extension property. So the downward closure is, 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 is straightforward. Let, let's, let's show that. Um, so if it's not a matroid, that means I violates one of the two matroid properties, and we're gonna take these in order. So uh, first, Let's suppose that I is not downward closed. So what does that, what does that mean? Uh, that means that uh, there exists um, a subset um, S, that's a subset of T. T is an independent set, but S fails to be an independent set. And 
we can see now it is our liberty to choose a weight vector. So what are we going to do? We're going to choose a weight vector that is heavy on S, making sure that that will be picked first, and then uh, something positive on the rest of T and zero everywhere else. So in other words, choose W with a weight vector W with WI equal to 2 if I is in S, 1 if I is in T but not in S, and 0 outside of T. And you can see what greedy algorithm is going to do. It's going to start adding elements of S, but it cannot add all of S. So it's going to skip at least one element of S. On the other hand, it's also plain to see from this weight, from this weight uh, function that the entire set T is um, the maximum weight independent set. So the greedy algorithm is going to fail. So just writing this out, greedy algorithm will skip at least one element of S while the optimal solution, not the greedy optimal solution, is all of t. All right, so now let's, uh, we're gonna do the same thing, but, but supposing that it's, uh, that it does satisfy downward closure, but doesn't satisfy this extension property. So suppose that i is downward closed, that says downward, but fails the extension property. What does that mean? It means that I can find two independent sets. One of them is strictly bigger than the other, but I cannot extend the smaller one with any of the elements of the bigger one. So there exist two not necessarily nested uh, independent sets with cardinality of S strictly less than the cardinality of T. However, S plus I fails to be an independent set for any I that's in T but not in S. Okay, so this is the failure. And now again, we're gonna design a, a weight function cleverly. So let's choose W with WI equal to Again, I'm going to entice it to choose elements of S first. And you'll see that then it's going to be stuck. So let's choose elements of S that have a little bit of extra weight. It's going to be 1 plus a little bit extra for I in S. 1 if I is in T but not in S. I don't, I'm not assuming T and S have any overlap at all, and zero otherwise. So you can see what happens. The greedy algorithm is gonna take every element of S, and then it will not be able to take any other elements of T. Possibly it takes some other elements that aren't in T, but those have weight zero. So uh, greedy solution, the greedy algorithm returns S. And we know that the weight of S is equal to the cardinality of S times one plus one over two S. All the weights are the same in S, and this is just S plus one half. But what does the weight of T produce? Every element in T has weight at least one. Possibly if it has overlap, it has weight more than one. So this is at least T. And we know that this is at least S plus 1. And that's the proof. So we see that this is indeed a characterization of, uh, of the optimality. So now we know a few things more about matroids. We know that optimizing over matroids, uh, the linear function over a matroid is, 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 uh, is easy. And we can just do it by the greedy algorithm. Um, in the next lecture, we're going to look a little more carefully at the rank function and make a link 
to another set of rich optimization problems that we're going to see in future lectures, uh, namely submodular functions.